yay. Well, I'm so glad to be here with you guys. Okay, so I feel like as I look around, I feel like I've met a lot of you, but uh, I was at CAM a few weeks ago, so I met some people there. Otherwise, I recognize people from church, but for those of you who haven't met me, my name is Alicia Penning. Um, a couple of things about me. Um, my husband is a pastor on the staff of Blackhawk. Um, we have three kids. I brought a picture of my family so you can see us. That's us. There's Adam. Um, our oldest, my daughter Marguerite, is a freshman in high school. Um, Will is in eighth grade. He'll be 14. It's so hard to believe in a couple of weeks. And then Charlie's my youngest. He's in sixth grade. So that's my family. Um, other things about me, I work on the staff of a campus ministry called Crew. Um, for many, many years, I worked with like the undergrad ministry with Crew, but for the last like, gosh, three and a half, almost four years, um, I've worked with like the division of Crew that ministers to university faculty and graduate students. So that's what I do for my job. Um, but this week, I've been thinking a lot less about my job and a lot more about um, the trip, the vacation that I have coming up, because uh, UW is on spring break next week, but my kids are also on spring break. So we're going to Arizona to visit my parents and my sister who lives down there. So I'm like really looking forward to like a week of uh, sunshine, <laughs> some hiking, some temperatures that are like consistently in the 70s, none of this like 70, 30s, so stuff like that. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, my sweet husband, of course, this is like spring break this year is like the week before Easter, and Easter is kind of a big deal for pastors, so he doesn't get to come. <laughs> he felt like he couldn't take the week off the week before Easter, so anyway, if you happen to be at Black Hawk downtown this next Sunday, um, give him a little extra love, because he's going to be feeling a little bit sad about missing us, but I am looking forward to that. I was thinking this week about the week before spring break when I was a student and trying to remember like what that felt like. Um, I, I felt like most years there was this mix of feelings for me. Like I often had like papers that were due that week and exams, like it felt like kind of an intense week. But at the same time, there was this like building anticipation for something really fun that was coming. Like if I got to either go home and see my family or go on a trip with friends, there was like, and usually that like positive kind of overshadowed the negative. So I often, like the week before spring break felt like kind of a fun, exciting week, even though there were pressures. Um, most weeks when I was in college, there was one year where this was definitely not the case. My junior year of college, the weeks leading up for spring break were some of my hardest in college. And that is because um, I had been interviewing for an internship that I really, really wanted. It was the kind of internship that would have like basically landed me a job with this company I really wanted to work for after college, been through a few rounds of interviews, and I found out just before spring break that I did not get this internship. And so um, I, it like set off kind of this storm of emotion inside of me. There was, I really thought I had a pretty good chance of getting this, so there was confusion. There was suddenly fear and anxiety, because what am I going to do with my summer? There's a lot of like rejection and shame, like all of these feelings I was experiencing. And this was, I would say, like starting to affect my relationships, because things were like, coming out sideways at the people around me. I was like a difficult person to be around <laughs> during these weeks. I was short with people, snappish. I remember feeling like, okay, I gotta figure out what I'm doing with my summer. So I was like scrambling to fill out like, um, you know, applications for other things over the summer. I can remember once like being at my computer, a friend coming over just wanting to talk to me. I just like snapped at them. You know, it's just coming out of me. Um, I also, I was feeling this like amped up energy to figure things out, but at the same time, I'm feeling like I just want to hide. I didn't want to go to class. I'm like oversleeping. Um, one day, I like had set my alarm to get up for class and I, it went off. I didn't get off. I let the snooze go for probably two hours that day. <laughs> and that would like have been okay, except for the fact that I was living in my sorority house at the time. And so I shared a tiny room with three other girls. And I put them like all through that. That's like kind of a pretty selfish thing to do, to snooze for two hours. But I like just didn't want to go to class. I was curling up. This was just like all coming out of me. I wasn't like intentionally being a jerk. I didn't mean to be this way. I didn't want to be this way. It was just coming out of me. Has this happened to you guys? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Like. Okay, it's like you're going through life, 
and everything's fine. You're going along, but something happens. It doesn't even have to necessarily be something like existentially huge, just something like on the scale of like on the spectrum of difficult. You may not even know exactly what's going on inside of you, but life comes along and it bumps your cup. And suddenly, like what's inside just kind of spills out all over the people around you, right? Um, this is what, it's just water, so I'm sure it'll be fine, but <laughs> this is what had happened to me in these weeks. Um, the people in my life were experiencing unpleasant things for me, like the mess was coming out of my cup this week, and the people in my life reacted in different ways. Um, my roommates, who I considered at the time to be some of my best friends, they just primarily seemed annoyed with me and like didn't want to deal with me. Um, and eventually they ended up like being kind of cruel about it. Um, I remember one conversation with them where some of the details of this are fuzzy, but I remember I was like trying to explain to them a little bit about what I was going through. And they just seemed like pretty dismissive and they were also kind of teasing me about it. And during this conversation, I'm feeling like more and more defensive as it went on. And then when I left the room, this part I remember clearly, I closed the door and it was like the count of, and they all three like erupted in laughter. So it was very hurtful in the midst of what was a pretty hard season for me. Um, luckily, these were not the only relationships in my life. I was also involved with another community. None of my roommates were Christians. Um, I was also involved with a ministry on campus, a lot like Cam. Um, I was pretty like, newly involved, marginally involved at this point though. I had not really followed Christ my first couple of years of college. I partied a ton um, and I'd really like just given my life to Christ a couple of months before this in the middle of my junior year. So I still felt like new to this community, but I had joined a Bible study um, and I remember just feeling so isolated from my other friends that I decided I was just kind of on a whim, I'm gonna walk over to my Bible study leader's house. And I remember like walking over there knocking on the door, and I was like, met with such a different spirit by the girls that lived in this house. I hadn't logged like nearly as much time with these Christian girls as I have with my roommates, but when I got there, they just like really obviously cared about me. Like they sat with me, they let me talk, they hugged me, they asked some questions. There was like just really a sense of warmth, like a sense that I was accepted, um, even though I was still like an emotional mess. And these girls like invited me to stay the rest of the week at their house, which I did, because I didn't want to go back to my roommates. I was still a mess. I think for them, I was actually still pretty difficult to be around. But these girls, it felt like they just really saw me, you know, and I felt understood in the midst of that season. I'd say I really was met with compassion by them. And that was really a turning point for me in my faith, actually, because the contrast between those women and my roommates helped me to see, oh, this is the kind of community that I want to be a part of. And, and even more than that, this is like the kind of person that I want to become. I want to become a person who is compassionate and be a part of a compassionate community like that. So I know you guys, I think this is the very last talk in your series on becoming new how God transforms us as we follow Jesus into people that actually become like Jesus. And, and tonight, what I want to spend the rest of our time talking about is becoming people who are compassionate. Um, I didn't know it at the time, but what I was experiencing from my Bible study leader and her housemates was the reality of Colossians 3, 12 and 13. It's become like one of my favorite passages in the scripture. It's actually become like a life verse for me. It says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. So this verse, of course, like it's an instruction for God's people. It's a command. But I think like more than that, I think this is a picture of what God wants his people to look like. Like the picture here is that when we clothe ourselves, like when we, when we take on, when we embody, when we live out compassion, what this practically looks like is, is bearing one, with one another. And of course, like forgiveness uh, is part of that. But what I wanna sit with for just a second is this idea of bearing with each other. Like what does that mean? Um, 
Because I think it means what, that when things spill out from our cups and other people's cups, like that mess, that uncomfortable, like often sinful stuff that spills out, compassionate people meet that mess with love and understanding. It doesn't mean that we like let go of boundaries, embrace toxicity in our relationship. That's not the picture um, that this depicts here when it tells us to bear with each other. It just, this is about like our posture. It means that in compassionate communities, there's really an underlying posture of love, of wanting to like understand. So there's like a ton of stuff to say about this. A lot more I could say about compassion, about bearing with each other. But as I thought about you guys tonight and talking about compassion, more than anything else, I wanted to like share with you guys, I wanted to do two things. I was like, okay, first, I want to kind of draw you into what it feels like when your mess spills over and being met with compassion and to give you a picture of what that can look like in a community. And then the second thing I want to do is, and what I want to do with the rest of our time actually, is to tell you, is to teach you something that's probably helped me live out compassion more than anything else that I've learned over the years. Um, so I'm not going to spend like the rest of our time unpacking any more of a package of scripture. The rest of tonight kind of falls under the category of like a skill. Like I want to teach you guys a very practical skill tonight that is a way to demonstrate compassion to people. Um, I did not, the skill that I'm going to talk about, I did not learn this until I was well into my 20s after I was on staff with crew for a few years. Um, but after I learned this, it made me a better like mentor and discipler of younger women. It definitely made me a better friend. Um, but I would say the relationships that over the years it's impacted the most are the relationships that are like the, the, the really core relationships in my life. This is something that I use uh, maybe not every day, but almost every day with my husband. And this skill is something that, um, you know, since having children, I regularly use with them. And so um, I would just say, this is the thing that's helped me grow in my ability to demonstrate compassion in like all of my relationships across the board. I do it better because I use this skill. So um, what we're talking about tonight is something called the listening cycle. Um, it's a specific kind of listening with a few specific skills. I'm not like going to try to give you tips on being a better listener. This is like a kind of a totally separate thing. But I want um, to walk us through this tonight. But as I do this, I think it will be better if the rest of this feels like this last part of what I'm doing up here feels more like a workshop than a message, if that's OK. So what I'm, I'm going to like ask you guys to participate, like to call some stuff back up. I'm going to make you talk to me. I'm going to make you talk to each other. I also very like cheesily brought some like note taking sheets <laughs> with some things for you as I go through the slides. So I am going to have like um, my helpers, M&M, &M, are going to hand those around. So if you don't want to take notes, that's totally fine. But just to help you follow along, it's here. Um, so this kind of listening, as we launch into this, this is really more, this is like not, you don't use this, and I don't use this in every conversation. This is like a specific kind of listening that I'm going to teach you about tonight. It's for like more important things in life. So it isn't for like lighthearted banter, small talk. I usually, like I'm listening for cues that will tell me I need to shift into this mode. It's when I detect something where there's some emotional energy behind something or something that's sensitive or I realize there's like a story to be shared and I want to draw it out a little more. So it's when I sense there's like more going on than meets the eye. Um, I also for sure, like this is the skill in conflict that I use that helps me work through conflict. I feel like Adam and I in our, and this is like honestly when we mostly use it is when we're having conflict. Um, <laughs> So how many times a week did I say I use that? But we, um, <laughs> but I feel like like 90% of our conflicts, honestly, we get like like it's resolved just by us, both of us doing this. That's how powerful it is. So um, okay, but it's not necessarily for everyday conversation. That's what I'm getting at. So before we get into this, this is like participation number one. Okay, what would you guys say is the goal of good listening? What do you think is the overall goal of good listening? Yes. Yes, it's understanding. 
okay? The goal of listening is understanding. Um, and I think this is important. I mean, I'm like, this is why it's so profoundly tied to compassion. Because it's not about just, like when we listen, we're not just giving people the space to emote or to process. This is about doing like the hard and skilled work of actually understanding another human being. So the goal of listening is understanding. Tell me, um, even from your guys' experience, what are some mistakes that people make in listening? What keeps people from listening well and achieving understanding and listening? Yes, like you're, you're listening, but really you're thinking, how am I going to respond to this? My, what's my brilliant response going to be? Yeah. What else? What, what's that? Oh, okay, okay, like you're feeling sorry for someone instead of trying to like really get into it and understand, okay. Biases, okay, yes, yeah, that's a big one. You've got your own ideas already that you're coming into the conversation with. Yes, Hema, I know about that. From, from myself, not from you. Um, any other things that can short circuit listening? Distraction, okay, yes, this thing right here, right, yeah. Tone, okay, so like, yeah, it's just, especially if you're listening, I mean, I think there's like both a, when you're, li there's like a tone we, we give, there's also a nonverbal tone that we give. You know, if, our, if we're like seeming closed off, like we can seem, our body language can seem hostile too. Yeah, yeah, totally. We could go on and on about this. But, um, but yeah, those are things that really short circuit understanding. So, um, okay, in this listening cycle, you'll see on your notes, there's like, there's five parts to this. And you guys will see as we begin to go through it. I'm going to, the, the first two, um, I would say are pretty intuitive. A lot of you guys, this is not going to be a surprise. I'm going to still walk through them because I think it's useful. But I would say, um, hang with me because especially skill three and skill four, I have never... Uh, met anyone who does those unless they've been trained in them, okay? Um, but the first two are pretty intuitive. The first part of the listening cycle is to attend. Um, so this means that you give someone your full attention, okay? What are some ways that we do this? How do we attend in a conversation? How? Yeah, put your, you put away the distractions. Yeah, the phone is the big one. But even too, I think often for me, like I'm like, folding laundry or making dinner or doing the dishes, like this is my life as a mom of three kids. Someone comes into the room and wants, or I get a phone call from my sister or something. And oftentimes in a regular conversation, I'll just keep chatting as I'm doing my things. But if I pick up a cue like, oh, this is, there's some energy behind this. There's something going on. Then what you want to do is like set down the thing. You attend with your posture too. Like you want to turn towards somebody you give them eye contact. Um, these are all ways that we attend in a conversation. Um, it's really about giving someone your, your full attention. And of course, you guys can imagine there's some things that really derail this. Um, one of them is what Steven said earlier. It's the temptation to think of your response. Like that really keeps you from attending to what someone is saying. The, the key to good listening is following. Like you've really got to work hard. And you'll see why as we go on. You cannot do the fourth part of this if you haven't attended well. So you want to follow what they're saying instead of thinking of your response. How, what are they, you know, in a conflict, sometimes like they're just, they've clearly misunderstood something and there's a temptation to think, oh, I want to correct them. I want to correct it or whatever. Or how can I respond to this if they only know this? But I would say at this point in the listening cycle, you just want to give them your full attention. Um, the next part of this is called acknowledging. Any idea what this might be? So I'm doing this. Hema's doing this to me right now. She's nodding her head. This is where you like verbally and non-verbally, like you're acknowledging and following what people are saying. This is another thing we all, like generally, people do this pretty well. Um, so we do this by things like shaking our head, by saying little small things that, that don't interrupt them, but let them know you're listening. Oh, uh-huh, mm-hmm, yeah, wow. You know, things like that. Sometimes even like just reflecting a quick emotion like, oh, scary or frustrating, that's, a, that's another way to acknowledge what someone's, 
what someone's talking about. Um, so you're letting them know that you're with them when you acknowledge. Okay, third part of this, and this is where um, hopefully this will be helpful and new. The third skill is called inviting. Okay, so when someone is like telling a story, a person naturally tells a story or they're talking about something, and then naturally in conversation there's a pause. And here in the pause is where we usually interject our own response or we move to asking a question. But both of those things like make us sort of take the reins and steer the conversation in the direction that we want to go. That can really derail like a story or a sensitive conversation. So instead, what you want to do is invite the person to tell you more. So here's how we do that. You say things like, there's a pause, and you say something like, keep going. Or, tell me more. Or, what else? Okay, you don't want to say, tell me more about, and then, because then you're steering the conversation. You're just inviting wherever they want to take it. You want to invite them to keep going. Okay, so tell me why, why is this skill important? What does this do in a conversation? Yes, yeah, yeah. You're really communicating them, like, I'm interested. I care about the whole story. Um, and it lets them know that, like, you're, you just, you, you want to let them take it where it wants to go. Um, it also can let people know if it's a sensitive conversation where there's, like, there's tension and you're in the midst of a conflict, by inviting and asking them to tell you more, you're also letting them know that you're not offended or afraid of where the conversation is going and that you can handle, like, whatever they're telling you. Especially if you can tell them that with, like, kind of an open, warm posture, like, tell me more, really communicates a lot of care in a conversation. There was a, just an example of, a, of this. There was a student I knew um, back in my undergrad days with crew, and they'd, they just learned this listening cycle. Um, and they had a boss that was like really hostile to Christians. And so this student's boss like knew he was a Christian and would like go off on these like tirades about how terrible Christians were. Um, so one day his boss, like right after he'd learned this, his boss like went off on one of these and instead of trying to like gently defend Christians or help him understand or whatever, the student just said, well, tell me more. And the student said it was like the temperature in the conversation just like, it, it had been really high. Like there was a lot of anger and emotional energy and the temperature just dropped. And what happened was the student's boss just totally opened up about these relationships in high school with Christians that had really hurt him. And it ended up going in a totally a, a direction the student couldn't have foreseen. And later on, that boss actually ended up coming to church with him. So it had a very powerful like de-escalating effect in that relationship. Um, in conflict, I would say inviting is often the part that really requires like discipline and humility because when, you, when you're sensing the emotional temperature is, is high, you sense to start, it start to rise, um, what happens often is like we want, like I find myself wanting to interject, I find myself feeling defensive um, or wanting to like clear the record. I feel like this is where inviting is most important because it's like the de-escalation zone. Um, this is, I feel like, the place in like my marriage with Adam, I would say we have a fair amount of conflict because we're two like individual people, but we don't really have like, not very often, I mean a few times in our marriage, we don't have a lot of like fights where our voices are raised or anything because both of us have been practicing this for years and we're able to like say invite more when there's like conflict or energy behind things. Um, so I would say you, you wanna like avoid asking questions at this point, but you invite someone to tell you more and they begin to talk and then you can see this is why it's a cycle. Like then you go back up to like attending and acknowledging and then they keep talking and then they come to a point and they stop again. And what do you do? You invite again. Like you're basically gonna keep inviting in a conversation until the person, until you say, is there anything else? And the person says no. That's when you move on to the next phase. <laughs> but basically, sometimes you're inviting and they're talking for a long time if it's a sensitive thing. Um, 
Okay, so um, yeah, let me just, I, I guess actually, I had another story I was gonna tell, but I'm gonna skip it because of time. Um, okay, so the last part, um, and I think this is probably the hardest skill, uh, actually this is the fourth skill. Skill number five, you guys will all know. Skill number four is to summarize. And this is where like, if you haven't attended, um, you won't be able to do this. But when you summarize, what you're doing is summarizing what you've heard the person say so far, so you reflect it back to them. This is where like the work of full attention pays off because this is really hard. If you haven't followed them, like your attention has wandered or you've spaced out for a minute, started thinking of your own response, you'll find like you just won't be able to do this. Because what you do when you summarize is after you've invited the last time, is there anything else and they say no, then what you wanna do is you don't summarize by saying, I understand. Because probably you, you really may not, it's kind of an arrogant response. What summarizing does is it demonstrates understanding, like you're gonna show them I've understood what you're saying. And so you're gonna say something like, oh, it sounds like, and then you do your best to like uh, restate what you've heard them say. Or, so what I hear you saying is, and then you restate it. Um, and then, after you do your best to restate it, and it can take a while if they've been talking for a while, and then you say something like, did I get that right? Like, ask them if you've understood, and they'll tell you yes or no. Like, sometimes they'll be like, yeah, that's it. Um, or sometimes they'll be like, no, actually, and they'll want to correct some things that you haven't understood. Um, and then when you do that, then you want to invite one more time. So go back after they say like, yeah, that's it. And say, well, is there anything else? Invite one more time. Um, and then go back and summarize the last things. But basically, you want to go through those first four things until you finally invite, you've summarized, you invite, and they say no, that's it. Um, and then at that point, then you can ask some clarifying questions. I think one of the things like, that I often hear when I ask people to describe good listeners is they'll describe people who ask good questions. And I think that can be helpful, but that really is not the heart of good listening. The heart of good listening is drawing out someone's story and really working to understand them. And so this is, this is a picture of how we do it. Um, okay, so I have like, two minutes left. I was gonna bring someone up here and like model this, but I think the better thing in the last two minutes that I have is for you guys to like turn to each other. Here's what I want you to do. Um, like I said, I'm not gonna make you share anything where you would like actually do this, <laughs> but I want you to practice. It feels very awkward to invite and summarize until you start to practice it. And I just want you guys to actually practice saying the words tell me more <laughs> and practice listening and having to summarize what someone is saying. So what I want you to do, turn to the person next to you and tell them about a memorable trip that you've taken for like 30 seconds and the other person just practice, practice inviting, saying tell me more and practice summarizing, okay? Go. Okay, did at least one per did you get to invite at least one time and summarize? Okay. Okay, so here's my challenge for you guys. I think I I think it would be great if you found a buddy in the room and actually practiced this a little bit. This is like it I so I really honestly I have done this long enough 
that this comes, it does not feel awkward to me to invite her to summarize. But when I first started, it really did. And so I would say, if you have like a roommate that's here tonight or a friend, just go out for coffee and be like, okay, super cheesy, but do you want to practice, like Alicia said, okay? Because <laughs> really, this will, this will go a long way. And I, I just, um, okay, two things I want to leave you with. I want to leave you with one caveat. Okay, this is supposed to help you understand someone and give them space to be understood, but you don't want to force this. Like, we invite, we give space, but sometimes you can tell there's more and someone's not ready to talk about it. And that is okay. So this is about our posture. We want to be posture. We want to be people who have a posture of like inviting and showing that we care and being able to actually demonstrate compassion to each other when someone's ready to share something. Um, the last thought I want to leave you with is this: compassionate understanding. I think for us as followers of Jesus, this really is like a very profound way to demonstrate the presence of Christ to people. Because um, when the Bible talks about Jesus' compassion, one of the ways it says he demonstrated his compassion is by, like, understanding us. Like, that's why he became human. The way, or one of the reasons, anyway, that he became human. Hebrews says, we have a compassionate high priest, and he became like us in every way except for sin. So Jesus' identification with us, his understanding of us, it really is at the heart of the gospel. And so when we listen to understand another person, we can offer a very profound gift to them. So let's be people that clothe ourselves in compassion like that and seek to understand one another. Let me pray for you guys. Um, Lord, I just want to thank you for um, this group of friends here tonight. And Lord, I pray that um, you would help us to be people, to become people, and become a community that really feels deeply caring to one another and to the people outside of us um, so that we can point people to you and also so that we can like be who you want us to become, that you have made us new. I pray you would help us to take steps to actually step into that demonstrate this newness that you've put into our hearts, Jesus. Make us compassionate. In your name, amen.